Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Anthropology of Religion. My name is Sasha Henninger, and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. Um, there's all sorts of information about me in the Getting Started module about me page, so please check that out. Um, and, and let me know if you have any questions. I look forward to, to meeting you on, on the discussion boards as well. Um, I want to jump right into our lectures uh, for this semester. So um, you're going to want to open up your introduction to the anthropology of religion PowerPoints. And these um, video lectures are going to um, follow along or allow you to follow along um, with those PowerPoints, you know, for note taking and things like that. Um, for your exams this semester. So I'm super excited. Um, anthropology of religion is my is one of my fields um, of study. It's one of my fields of interest. Um, and I, I truly love this class. And I, I love anthropology. Um, if you haven't taken an anthropology course before, um, you'll learn a little bit about what anthropology is from your first chapter. But um, anthropology is the study of humanity, right? Anthropos um, or anthro essentially means human or mankind, um, humankind. And the logi is the study of. So it's the study of humankind or the study of humanity, which is an incredibly broad thing, right? To, to try to, um, quote unquote, understand humanity, especially from a cultural perspective. We are enormously diverse all around the world in our beliefs and norms and values, um, and that includes in our religions. So um, in this course, we are going to learn about what anthropology is, and how anthropologists study religion in particular. What is unique about this methodology um, and how do we apply it to the wide range of subjects we're gonna get a chance to cover in this class. So one thing I wanna kind of clarify quickly um, is that you know anthropology's beginnings, the quote unquote beginning of anthropology is unfortunately steeped in racism and, and even colonialism to some extent um, because the, the earliest people, we probably wouldn't call them anthropologists today, but the earliest people who did study people um, you know, in terms of living with them and learning about them and getting that information back, um, were people that were using that data against those populations. And, and obviously, um, we're going we're gonna to talk about ethics in this class, you're going to read about ethics. Um, and that is certainly not something that anthropologists do today. Um, the purpose of collecting this data is for understanding. Um, and then as I will try to kind of um, incorporate into the class throughout the semester, sometimes we apply that information to social problems. So we're going to run into some human rights violations, for instance, in this class, or what, what we may consider to be human rights violations. And we're going to approach that from an anthropological perspective and say, okay, well, is it just because Western people think it's a human rights violation? Is it a real human rights violation? What, where's the draw of the line drawn? Um, and if we want to help, if we want to solve this particular issue, um, how can we do so respectfully while you know still being uh, relevant and relative to that particular culture? All concepts that we're going to learn about today. So anthropologists today are meant to be as objective as possible and to study um, populations in a unique way where we earn their trust and rapport um, and then we can we can put that knowledge to good use. So there's a number of key anthropological concepts that I want to discuss in this particular lecture. Um, the first is holism. So holism is, you may have heard the phrase, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. And that kind of uh, um, underlies this concept of holism, that, uh, you know, if we want to understand humanity, let's say, we can't just look at our biology. And we can't just assume religion or we can't just assume culture and that one perspective is going to help us understand this complex organism that we are. Um, instead, we take a holistic approach and we make sure that we include all the elements that make up humanity because each of them is interdependent. Um, and without them, the whole does not exist. So the sum of the parts is greater than the whole essentially means that we want to put and place special emphasis on all the components that make the whole because without them, the 
the whole doesn't exist. And they, you know, are interdependent on each other. So even though this class is about religion, we're absolutely going to um, venture into other topics like gender um, and race and ethnicity um, and, and politics and economics and kinship and family. I mean, we are going to incorporate a wide range of um, topics as well as um, other disciplines. So this is a four field discipline. Anthropology includes biological anthropology, um, which is the study of evolution um, and DNA and the more molecular components. And, and while it doesn't seem like that would be relevant to this class, I will include some biology here and there because it helps us to understand things like altered states of consciousness, for instance. Um, then there's cultural anthropology, which of course this class falls into. There's archeology, span which is the study of um, the things that we leave behind essentially. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on archeology span in this class, but we are um, in the next lecture series going to look at maybe some of the evidence that a religion is happening, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, even. So um, we'll touch on that a little bit. And then there's linguistic anthropology. And, and we're not going to go much into linguistic anthropology in this course, um, but we will in a few ways. Linguistic anthropology is about human language. It's about where our languages come from. Um, it's about how we use language, verbal and nonverbal cues, which you're going to need to pay attention to when you do your own um, field work this semester. And, um, you know, etymology, you know, words and how they change over time and how they impact um, us and how culture impacts the words that we use. Um, we're going to look at all sorts of concepts, um, you know, uh, all sorts of terms etymologically that anthropologists use that that um, are kind of umbrella terms like shaman, for instance, um, even though that word belongs to one population in Russia, the Tungus people, anthropologists use it as an overarching umbrella term. So we'll hit language and linguistics a little bit in this class. Um, each of those courses is available through the college. So if you're interested in those topics individually, I would encourage you to take them. Um, but for the sake of this class, that's what holism means. When we try to understand humanity in this class, we're going to look at um, you know, our biology. We're going to look at why certain things have evolved, why certain behaviors have evolved from a behavioral ecological perspective. We're going to look um, at cultural fieldwork and studies of um, cross-cultural concepts all over the world. We're going to look a little bit at, at um, you know, the things that people have left behind that inform our understanding of the history of religion. And we're going to talk a little bit about linguistics as well, because all of these things make the whole. Um, and that's where intersectionality comes into play. So this is a buzzword you've probably heard in other classes, but intersectionality is the idea that um, our, our identities are an intersection of a wide range of things. And we do need to consider this in the class because as we move into this kind of second bullet point here, worldview, I have collectivism and individualism. And these are two different worldviews, overarching worldviews. There are individualized societies like the U.S., um, you know, where the individual is most important and we're very focused on individual rights and individual responsibilities. Um, but in collective societies, the individual tends to be less relevant. Um, and, and really your existence as an individual is more as part of the whole. And the expectations in those cultures are going to be focused more on sacrifice, sacrifice for the larger group. And depending on how you were raised, right, with a collective identity or an individual identity, it's going to very much determine how you see literally everything around you and how you understand everything around you. And so that's part of our intersectional identity is our, our background, where we come from. Um, if your um, you know, ethnic background or your religious background, for instance, is extremely collective, right? That may mean that, you know, you, you perhaps your parents are very restrictive about who you're allowed to marry and things like that. That is going to be um, very impactful on your identity. It's going to be um, a part of a kind of understanding behavior. So we want to keep this in mind moving forward in literally every subject in this class, because we're going to come across lots of things that to the average Westerner, to the average quote unquote American, they may seem a little bizarre, right? They may seem uh, like they don't make sense. And a lot of these behaviors will make sense if you understand that they are driven by a collective identity. 
Enculturation is the process of learning that particular identity. So enculturation is the lifelong learning process for um, how we learn to be a member of our own culture. And it happens from the moment we're born um, until we die. And, and that is where you learn um, all the elements that intersect for your identity. That's where you learn your worldview. And your enculturation is going to be very hard to um, step out of. And we're going to practice that a little bit in our ethnography um, in this class. So ethnography is, um, ethno means culture, graphy is kind of um, the story of. And so an ethnography is the story of a culture. Um, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, this is all that anthropologists did. They went to far off exotic lands and they studied these people for five, six, seven years. Then they wrote this 600 page book. We're going to meet a few of those um, in this class that kind of was everything about this particular culture. That was an ethnography. Now, some ethnographies can be more specific, like focusing on just a particular ritual or some aspect of society, but that's essentially what an ethnography is, um, to do an ethnography, to really get accurate data as an anthropologist, um, we have to step a little bit outside of our enculturation, our beliefs and our values. And we're gonna learn how to do that in this class um, through these kind of two main perspectives, emic and edic. So edic with a T is the outsider's perspective. This is you kind of entering into a new culture, a new restaurant, wherever it is, you're the outsider. You're not familiar with what's going on. You don't understand the context for everything that's happening in the community. You're just kind of observing as an outsider. And so you're going to have an outsider's perspective and you're going to write about it kind of as an outsider, as somebody estranged from that particular culture. But the goal of anthropologists is to get to the emic perspective, to um, which is the insider's perspective. And that means to kind of understand what you're observing from the perspective of the people who are members of that particular culture as much as is humanly possible, which means that you have to let go of um, what we're gonna call ethnocentrism. So if I skip over here a little bit to our, our bottom uh, word, ethnocentrism means that you believe your culture is superior. And um, whether you you believe you think this or not, um, it often comes up and it'll come up in our behaviors and it'll come up when you're doing your ritual ethnography for this class. There may be moments where you think, oh, thank God I'm not doing this or, oh, I, you know, this is weird or this is bizarre. Um, you're going to have those thoughts and they're not necessarily terrible, right? Part of enculturation is, is meant to kind of... Um, you know, protect the cultural identity of your group. And sometimes that means that you have to look at other cultural identities as, as bad. And, and, and we may have been brought up to kind of assume that our way is the right way or that our people are the first people, especially if you're religious. Um, when we get to the origins of, of um, you know, myth on um, origin stories and creation stories about religion, they almost always make, you know, your people the first people. Um, and so there's a little inherent ethnocentrism in, in most religious identities um, to some extent. But what we want to do is kind of be able to step outside of that and gain the emic perspective, get on the inside and be what we call culturally relative. Um, cultural relativism means that you respect the traditions and values and norms of a particular culture because they make sense in the context of that culture. And the best way that you can do that is by finding the strange in the familiar and the familiar in the strange. Sorry about that switch there. And I'm going to ask you to do that in your discussion this week to kind of reflect on this quote, finding the strange in the familiar and the familiar in the strange. So if we break this down into two sections, finding the strange in the familiar, one uh, what this is trying to say essentially is the, the the best way to be culturally relative and to get out of your ethnocentric ideas is to kind of take a step back and look objectively, edically at your own culture and think, you know what, I can see why somebody else might find this weird. Um, you know, think about things that um, may be a little bit bizarre in our culture um, comparatively to the rest of the world, like eating certain types of meats or taking baths or practicing certain religious rituals or, um, you know, gun ownership or, the, you know, there's a lot of things in the U.S. that seem so normal, right? Greed and materialism um, that, 
you know, they seem like the natural way, right? But there is no natural way. Everything in us, you know, is is influenced by our environment and our culture. Um, and so take a moment to kind of step outside and, and, and look at your daily activities and look at what it's like to be a member of your culture and say, okay, I get it, right? I could see how people think this is particularly uh, you know, this is weird. So think about things that um, outsiders might find weird about, about your culture. Now, the second part of this phrase, the familiar and the strange, is the opposite. It's finding things that may seem outrageous to you, that may seem extreme to you in what we're going to see this semester, and, and find some familiarity in it. Like, okay, right? Okay, I get it. Um, scarification, for instance, people who scarify their babies, you know, who make cut marks on, on their children's face in order for them to have their cultural identity and for them to be protected by the spirits of their community. You know, if you were to do that to your child in the US, your child would be taken away and you'd go to jail, right? But, um, you know, are there things that we do to our babies that may seem outrageous to other cultures? Well, we circumcise babies, right? Um, we pierce their ears. Um, you know, we leave them at daycare, which some cultures are absolutely uh, horrified by that idea that we would leave our babies with a stranger, right? So finding the familiar and the strange means to kind of find some familiarity in what we're watching, what we're looking at that may seem strange to you so that you can connect with it a little bit. And I know this seems um, counterproductive because I'm going to ask you in this class to be objective, which means to kind of step outside of your personal feelings. But as we will learn, it's really impossible to do that. It's impossible to be totally objective, at least. Um, you're always going to have some of your enculturation impacting your decisions and your focus and your thought processes. So you're going to do the best that you possibly can to do that, um, you know, and, and ride that line where you're able to take what you know and understand and experience and feel and use it to better understand what it is that we're watching and doing and learning about in this class. And it's going to be very important that you do this because that is how we get objective data um, is we put our biases aside and we take the time to kind of enter into a culture, be accepted into that culture and truly get that first person experience. So in the next section, I am going to um, show you methodology, how we actually collect this particular data and the unique methods that we use as a discipline. So I'll see you back here in our next video. There we go. <laughs>